So thanks everyone for, for joining. Uh, my name is Patrick Hankinson. I'm a partner over at Concrete Ventures. Uh, we are a $17 million Atlantic Canadian pre-seed fund. Uh, we're focused on great ideas and founders looking to build massively scalable businesses right here in Atlanta, Canada. One of our core values is to have an impact on the broader startup community outside of our direct portfolio and pipeline development is key uh, for us. Given the success of our last webinar with HubSpot, we wanted to continue providing similar valuable content. And that's why we partnered with Chargeify to create a webinar to help startups master their SaaS pricing and billing in 2021. Uh, during this webinar, you can ask questions directly in the Q&A uh, feature on, on Zoom and uh, uh, Jared and the Chargeify team will try their best to answer them either during the, uh, the webinar or at the end. I'd uh, also like to thank Corey Han, our associate, for taking the lead on this webinar. And I'd like to thank Jared and the entire Chargeify team for all the hard work that went into this webinar. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jared. Appreciate it. Thank you, Patrick. Hello, everyone. First off, I want to thank Concrete Ventures uh, for letting us partner with them on this webinar and present to the network base here that's joining us today. Pricing and billing is our passion at Chargeify, and I'm very excited to be sharing this topic with you all today. For me personally, this is something that I've always been involved with here at Chargeify. Uh, it's always been great to see how we've adapted our models over the last 12 years of business and really what goes into this. So for us being, you know, speaking on pricing, but also speaking on you know, the billing portion of it too, uh, it just kind of all culminates together. So <clears throat> a little bit about myself. You know, my name is Jared Dassalam. I'm head of channel sales here at Chargeify. So today I help merchants evaluate their billing ecosystem and explain Chargeify's offerings, where it sits in their business and how it will help them efficiently scale their offering or offerings. Prior to working in B2B SaaS, I was in sales for physical goods. I was a touring musician and still continue to produce music today. Kind of odd there, but uh, <laughs> favorite spots to play back in the day were uh, the iconic Whiskey A Go Go on the Sunset Strip in LA and uh, the Aztec Theater here in San Antonio. Uh, my wife and I would love to travel when possible. It's COVID, you know, got to watch those regulations, but uh, trying to get outside, get outdoors, trying to be as venturous as we can, really like to get out and do that. Uh, and then lastly, I love that they added this little thing here. Um, I have a mini golden doodle who will hopefully not be barking during this webinar. Um, her name's Briley. She's two years old and she's the closest thing that we have to a child and probably will have for quite some time. Uh, she's quite a handful, but Anyways, enough about me. Let's dive into the real reason we're here. So uh, this wants to go ahead. There we go. So what are we going to be talking about today? Well, first, we're going to be starting with the state of SaaS pricing. So what that means, what does this mean for you and your business, where it is in the market, and why are we even talking about pricing and billing in the first place? Kind of, you know, aren't they the same thing? Do they go hand in hand? You know, what is that? Then that will set us up to talk about the different pricing models and how they're set up what do they mean? And what do they mean for your customers? And what does it mean for your business? And how does it bring, lastly, the value to the customers? So that's one thing I want to key on here is value will be a very common theme throughout this presentation today. Value is the paramount focus of what should drive pricing in a competitive SaaS world. And you'll hear me say this over and over today, really, really hoping to, to drive this home. So naturally, this will move into how we'll be building the pricing models which, is, which are the building blocks for, well, again, the pricing model. <laughs> so how do you culminate this? How do you put this together? How do you formulate your pricing strategies? And how do you build upon it appropriately with what you're going to be offering? Then we'll go into understanding that pricing and billing strategy. So how do they coincide? What is the difference? Why do we separate pricing and billing as two different things? You know, are, is there a difference between the two or are they actually the same? We'll break this down and what this is and what the fine line is between the two. So stay tuned for that towards the end. And then lastly, we'll jump into executing, executing uh, your pricing strategy through your billing ecosystem. So what this means is through your billing tool and operations that's going to efficiently operate and scale your current pricing, your offering, and equate that pricing with the billing of your customers. I know that might sound confusing now, but we'll start to break this down as we go along. Remember, please ask questions throughout this. So effectively, what we'll be doing today is translating that value of pricing and billing, understanding what it is, and hopefully getting an idea of that towards the end. So with that, let's get started. So first things first is the state of SaaS pricing. So first thing we have here is obviously I'm not going to be going through word for word on every one of these slides, um, but I do want to really hone in on this last portion over here, this 39% number. So 
The fact that only 39% of SaaS companies spend 10 hours or less on their pricing strategy per year kind of my, is kind of mind blowing. Like, please think about that for a moment. 10 hours or less per year is one in a quarter American working days for an entire year's worth of business. So if we kind of look at how often SaaS is changing, and if you're familiar with the SaaS market, you know it's quite a lot. So what is the market doing? You know, I think we can all state that after 2020, you know, we know the market doesn't just sit and twiddle its thumbs all day long. Like it's quite volatile at times. So let's kind of reference this here in the middle. Four and five companies are 80% change pricing at least once per year, often more. So are you really thinking about this? You know, according to Price Intelligently, which is a fantastic tool on pricing, you should do this at least twice per year. And in doing so, form a pricing committee or a subgroup. So something that's, you know, within the actual means of someone's normal day-to-day -day operations to work on the iterative changes to your pricing. This doesn't mean you go from a 499 model to a 399, 299, all of a sudden for the same product. If you do that, you might've priced incorrectly. <clears throat> Just means little tweaks, little changes here and there. So if we're only adapting our pricing models once per year and spending so little time in doing so, are we really tracking the value we're, up, we're offering with our pricing? Are we accurately reflecting our offering compared to the market and the trends that are in the market? Is our product so stale that it doesn't deserve a pricing change or even a pricing increase? Don't be scared to do that. If you're really putting time and effort into your product, don't be afraid to you know, make those changes or make those increases. Pay attention to the market. Again, we'll dive into that in a bit. As a growing business, this is beyond simply important, and it should really get you thinking about the trajectory of your current and your future market presence. When Chargeify started as a business, we were straight up free, not for profit, and offered ourselves as a beta platform focused on Web 2.0 businesses. So that's how you know it's pretty ancient when we were calling it Web 2.0 SaaS businesses back in the day. I don't think anyone says that anymore. But we quickly realized that we needed to move into a freemium model and start charging. Then years later, 12 years later, to be pretty precise, here we are today in a rep-driven, high-touch sales model and much different and thankfully much better than what we used to be offering you know, back when we first started. So we'll break this down later on and really what this means for everyone. So knowing the state of SaaS pricing and all of its intricacies, let's take a look at the different types of models out there. I'm not gonna talk through each of these in detail on this slide, but we are, however, going to break each one down, starting with flat rate, then move into usage, or excuse me, move into hybrid, then usage, prepaid, events-based billing, and we'll kind of talk about what each one of those means for you all, especially events-based billing. If you don't follow Chargeify, you'll understand a bit about what that means as well. So first things first, the grand old flat rate pricing model. I think everyone here is familiar with this um, across the board. So what does it mean? Flat rate pricing is by far the quintessential, in my opinion, B2C pricing model of the world. It's what every business and consumer thinks of. And the reason is because it's been highly successful as a consumer model. Why? Because it's basic, it's easy, it's easy to consume. And most importantly, the value matches that of the pricing structure. So let's think of Netflix, Apple Music, Spotify. They have a bronze, silver, gold type of plan. Obviously they aren't verbatim here, uh, what they're called, but the idea is exactly the same. You pay a one month or a month to month subscription where you can cancel at any time and call it what it is, or you get that famous annual discount <clears throat> that usually drops a month or two off the pricing in exchange for your annual commitment to their platform. They've done their research, said, hey, if we offer this as an annual package, we know they're gonna be here at least a year so we can at least get our money's worth out of it and you know get a bit more into it. This plan does not change its structure, but what's included in the plan or the offer might change as market trends change. So think about how many times Netflix has changed its pricing. It's recently going through a pricing change, lots of that constantly going on, but the structure has stayed the same. The only way people end up paying more as a consumer or as a business is usually by upgrading or downgrading their plans. Oftentimes these plans will also include a free trial offering for 14 or 30 days, or even be run as a freemium model. So that way you can get introduced into that paying plan once you've gotten a taste for the platform. Again, it's great for marketing and great for B2C SaaS. B2C is, or excuse me, B2B is usually not that simple, but we do run across it at times. And I've run across this as well, talking about Chargeify being originally freemium. We obviously introduced this as first. So let's expand a bit. In a hybrid model, this is where we can take the predecessor to this, that former, which is the base rate, and we can start adding more and more line items. These can be usage, quantity-based, one-time charges, prepaids, 
et cetera, anything that you need, right? These can be a lot of different things and the world really becomes your oyster here, if you will. Like there's a lot that you can start moving into this and expanding. So this is where a lot more businesses are going to sit, especially as we get geared towards B2B SaaS types of businesses and offerings. As I mentioned, rarely do I ever come across a B2B SaaS business who simply has one plan or rather one type of offering like the three simple plan structures and nothing else. Almost 100% of the time, a B2B business will have this hybrid model and then go bonkers with it every way possible, combining the future models uh, that we're going to talk about here in a moment and everything in between. So the first example we have here is the pay-as-you-go model, which is a simple usage model. Next to it, we have an example of a base rate plus metered usage billing. In this, we can now secure revenue as a business instead of hoping for that merchant to one day actually start processing revenue. This is extremely similar in how Chargeify and mostly every common billing system charges, a base rate plus overages. <clears throat> so let's take a look at that second base plus usage model. This also keeps a customer or a merchant in this case involved in interacting with the system. Well, why is that? Because they're being charged no matter what. This also keeps customers from driving up system costs for storing data and not really utilizing the system. Think about those offerings that you utilize today that are free versus those that are paid. Which are you more likely to actually gravitate towards and pay more attention to? It's likely not the free model. Then in this case, when you utilize the service, even though you're being charged for the usage value of it, you're getting the services from that charge, knowing that you're leading to business growth with this offering. Additionally, as a value note, <clears throat> I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the 2.9% and 30 cents model because it's the absolute gold standard of payment gateways across the industry. But why? Because the value is equal with the offering and the, the market has overall spoken and said, hey, this is determined to be the case here. Again, a direct link with value to the pricing that's going to be offering. So with the usage model like this in mind, let's move into usage-based billing. So as mentioned earlier, usage-based pricing or billing starts becoming more complex with SaaS companies. And forgive me for saying billing, that makes it very confusing here, talking about pricing. <laughs> what we have here are, are actually two contrasting usage-based models. The model on the left is a quantity-based license model where you choose the amount you want to use, aka pay for, in advance. And the other on this side is going to be billed in arrears. So the former is like a Salesforce. You get 10 users, 20 users, et cetera, and whatever I use, I choose that up front, and if I increase, great. I make the choice up front, and my pricing changes accordingly. Or inversely, I decrease my licenses, and then the billing system's logic, based upon the merchant's choice, um, choose you know, chooses to prorate uh, that for the customer, or do nothing at all, or even just wait for both of these changes to happen. You know, on that next interval. That's where the billing system comes into play, and to control that, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. The model on the right <laughs> is like taking that sliding scale and forecasting how much it will actually cost you to run your business, but again, a forecast is simply that. It's just a forecast. And the actual consumption of the services rendered by the merchant will actually determine what the final cost is, right? So based on what we actually use. So many businesses, when starting, they fail or never start usage billing at all. I get it all the time, I'm like, hey, Jared, I'd love to love to charge based on usage, but today we simply cannot. You know, common things I've heard are like, we don't have dev resources, we don't have the manpower to manipulate all our spreadsheets and different systems. We don't have room on the roadmap. We hacked it through a gateway or it's just, it's too complicated. I can't think about it. I've heard it all, I've heard every excuse in the book. So this is where something like a Chargeify comes into play and it's just a simple API call to pass that total bulk usage or an entry of the total amount on a subscription. That's easy. Chargeify then breaks that down in, <clears throat> excuse me, breaks the usage down, the pricing structures that you've set up and then builds and rates accordingly without the need for error prone or manual calculations. So this is where, uh, again, a billing engine would come into play to reduce the complex logic uh, for you all and then put it on, you know, on the system itself. So when looking for a billing system, searching for one that can actually break this down for you and take that pricing, which is seemingly again, overly complex and break it to a simple structure. This is where you're starting to get your competitive advantage then as you're starting to scale and grow your business and where billing doesn't become a blocker, but actually again, an advantage. So continuing with the usage information from what we just discussed, 39% of businesses are charging based on usage as we can see here. So this is important because this number is growing at a consistent rate. This is not slung down and the trend towards value-based pricing is only increasing. But again, why is that? So because usage links value with price. You use it, I get charged, I don't, I don't get charged. And when I am using it, like I mentioned prior, 
I'm getting value for the services that are in turn increasing my business. Um, or if I'm B2C, it's because I'm using it, enjoying it, whatever the process is there, right? So other types of usage models are as follows on the slide. You know, they can be per unit, which is not mentioned here, stair step at the bottom, tiered or volume based. So these models are often found in quantity models or prepaid models as well. They don't have to be just strictly build and arrears models. So just to touch on a few, volume-based pricing, a very common example, not SaaS whatsoever, but it's the first thing that comes into my brain is like a t-shirt thing. When you buy a bunch of t-shirts, say, hey, I'm gonna buy 10, and then the next 10 are, are at a discounted rate, next 10 are at a discounted rate. That's a volume-based pricing model. But how that works in usage is you get that discount per bracket, which then encourages the user or the business to spend more with your business. And then of course, now that they're doing that, they're getting the discounts as they increase. The inverse, essentially, if you will, is a tiered-based pricing model, which in a tier-based pricing model, we see a lot more of this in a B2B flow. So once you get to a certain bracket, we reduce the overall cost for that tier, and then now you've reached that threshold within that uh, tier, and you only pay uh, that tier price for the total consumed, not the uh, combination thereof. And then lastly, stair step is like we're saying, hey, within this, you know, we're going to buy a band of, you know, in this case, emails. And we're going to get charged based on wherever we fall within that band, but only for the full band. So essentially, it's like we're paying up front. You know, so in this example here, between 51 and 100 emails, if we have 72 emails, we're going to get charged $99 a month. Whether we go 72, 98, doesn't matter. We're in that bracket. Whereas if we go below 51, say we use 32 emails, it's free. So that's the stair step banding. It's very common, again, uh, more on the B2B side than anything else. So... Let's take a look at a few businesses that are utilizing usage models in an extremely effective manner today. In fact, most of these businesses are actually utilizing more of an events-based type of usage model or a combination of different types of usage. <clears throat> so starting on the left, one everybody here has probably heard of, I doubt anyone has not heard of them, <laughs> which would be AWS and specifically in this case, S3 storage, which offers separate price points based on the frequency of access, not just the total storage, uh, total storage size or total data size, right? If you need access to the data regularly, they have that standard tier, which starts at 2.3 cents per gig per month, which is important to note, it's a sub penny unit price. So let's keep that in mind. If you sometimes need access to that data or sometimes or rarely not at all, then you get an intelligent tier, which prices itself based on your access patterns. So you can also see this uh, in the inverse of their Glacier platform as well. That's sophisticated billing, and that's very common towards event space, which we'll talk about in a moment. Mailgun here in the middle is an email API service. They've got integrations to different things, advanced analytics, smart inbound routing, uh, and they've really established itself as a, as a bleeding email API on the market. <clears throat> so being able to effectively bill though has been a large portion of what they've been doing. So Mailgun offers a pay-as-you-go model for any emails you send beyond what's included in your plan. So usage beyond the scope of the plan follows a metered pricing model for, you know, let's say X dollars amount per, you know, a thousand emails or whatever is in your plan. They also offer a limited pay-as-you-go flex plan with limited features and it's viable for more of an early stage startup or smaller e-commerce stores. So this combination of fixed pricing tiers and usage-based pricing really has allowed Mailgun to position themselves for more than just one target market. They also utilize a combination of Chargeify's events-based billing, prepaid subscriptions, usage billing, and prepaid usage. There's a whole array of stuff on how Mailgun bills, uh, and there's probably some articles with that. But lastly, let's look at DigitalOcean here on the right. When you examine their pricing page, you can see it's sophisticated in the approach and how they're actually going to work with metered usage billing. Droplets and databases can be used and billed on an hourly or monthly basis, and their smallest droplet with a gig RAM and 25 gigs of solid state drive storage costs $5 a month or 0.7 cents per hour of usage. So again, we're getting very granular in how we're charging for that value. So for customers who only want static storage without computing, they've got devel they've developed you know, a specific product, I believe it's called uh, Space Object Storage product. And so overall though, DigitalOcean is an example of a subscription product with a mix of fixed pricing and subscription meter billing. So it has a single basic subscription, subscription plan. That is a fun word to say. <laughs> that applies to all potential customers. So it's a great example, really, of, of the hybrid model, right? Mold, utilizing multiple different things. So with all that, imagine doing this on a spreadsheet. Imagine calculating that manually or dealing with subpenny unit pricing and getting the calculations potentially wrong. 
this is where systems or why systems like Chargerify exist in the first place. We ingest that data for you, even beyond sub penny unit pricing, and do the complex calculations for you automatically with what we've already built into it. So given that this is about granularity, let's go into what I've mentioned a few times here, which is the events-based billing. So for Chargerify, what is beyond usage-based billing? And what does this mean? Events-based billing, as Chargerify says, is the next generation of billing for SaaS companies. And let's kind of understand why here. So if you've noticed a theme in the presentation, and I've mentioned this several times, it's all about linking value to price. Events-based billing allows customers to pay only for specific actions they take with your product. These are events within your product application that can be streamlined in real time, excuse me, streamed in real time and build on any specific attribute. So whether this is hours in a specific country, hours on a certain device, for example, let's say, you know, it's a B2C thing and you charge a user a different price for a streaming application on an Android TV at 12 o'clock in the afternoon on the East Coast versus on a Roku platform at 12 a.m. on the West Coast. Uh, you can get real granular with this and keep it in the same data stream. Another example could be taking this Twilio model here on the right, <clears throat> where we have this sub penny unit pricing at 0.75 cents per SMS. We could then break that down into SMS messages sent for su successful dunning versus non-successful dunning, what language that message was sent in, the times they were sent, and how many characters were in each message. So within this, we stream all this into one data stream and then Chargeify builds and rates it accordingly all in real time. So the invoice becomes simple. It's one line item. It's one line item in the catalog, then gets broken down in a segment so the customer can see exactly what their value is. Think of like a phone bill. You have your overall bill, but then it breaks it down. So overall, events-based billing, <clears throat> you can sum this up as advanced metered usage or advanced metered billing. This is an extremely great example of really driving that direct value with a consumer or a business. And it gets that offering that they've really signed up for, really what they're gonna be used, they know they're gonna be charged for it. So let's jump into another value-driven approach, which is my favorite, the prepaid model. So prepaid is really good as a merchant because it gives you the revenue upfront and then you keep that revenue, whether the consumer uses it on the other end or they don't use the services, right? So instead of somebody saying, hey, I'm gonna use this amount and hopefully I'll get to this and hopefully pay for it. It now goes to, hey, I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is. And once I, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and prepay for this upfront. Once I draw down from that amount, I'm gonna automatically refill it and then use more of your product. So this is security for you as a merchant for your offering. So you're not banking on the hope any longer that they're gonna actually use it. And as a consumer, this is great because we've already paid for the offering. So I like to think of this as something that becomes essentially free over time because the pain of that initial payment is really no longer there. It's no longer really realized. So let's take some real, real life examples here. So the first one I think of when I think of prepaid is a hybrid SaaS example where it involves physical goods in a SaaS product, and that is Bird Scooters. <clears throat> they have you prepay a certain dollar amount, and then you set a threshold at which you refill your original dollar deposit. So for me personally, <laughs> I made a $10 purchase on a Bird Scooter uh, probably a year or two ago, and I really haven't used it since. So Bird Scooters got my money, great for them. But the next time I use it, it seems free because I've already paid for it. So it's like, hey, I can go jump on and then I'll just automatically get billed again, kind of without realizing it. So from B2C sense, it works really well. Flip it to the B2B side. Twilio is a perfect model on this. In Twilio, you get a wallet and then you draw down against that wallet as you increase your usage. And when you hit your minimum threshold, then you auto top back up to that original amount. So now we're combining usage <clears throat> with that prepaid. So you get more granular again, adding real extreme value into what you're doing. So let's keep going. Building blocks for the pricing model is what we're gonna be discussing next. So <clears throat> what are these building blocks and how are they broken down? So we're gonna break this down into a couple of different things, five specific areas here, starting on the left, the type of SaaS model is the first thing we'll discuss. So high touch versus low touch. Do you have a self-service model where people sign up at will and manage themselves? or a sales rep driven model where multiple processes you know, must be in place before you can actually close a deal. Next is the value of your customers, what they're going to receive. So what are you offering as a product and how, you know, how does a customer perceive that value? Again, SaaS is all about the perception of value. I mean, we're not selling physical goods here that have like guaranteed fixed costs. And in SaaS, we have to make that connection that warm and fuzzies, if you will, uh, when selling that product in, in either SaaS model, in B2B or B2C. So next is the total cost of what everything will be. Well, <clears throat> what are the services you're rendering? How does it break down? How are we going to optimize this, which is gonna follow that? 
How do we pull this all together? And how does this ultimately affect our pricing model and our, and our pricing offer? And then lastly, my favorite, which is competitive pricing. I like this specifically because in whether you're in sales in B2C or B2B, it's extremely important to know your competition. So you aren't pricing yourself out of business by going too high or too low. So your pricing determines your competition, which determines your market space ultimately. So let's start first and grab a drink of water. So talking about high touch versus low touch models. So giving Chargeify as an example, Chargeify started out as a low touch to get people in the door. And then we went to a high touch model later on as we invested more into our product and our business. So in a low touch model, the most common thing, of course, is B2C model, self sign up, SaaS companies that rely on sending product uh, prospects directly to their website via like marketing channels or self-educated marketing research. The potential product is usually enticed with like a free trial, like, hey, here's our offering, a couple days. Um, and then they'll use that to hopefully go into and convert to a paid plan. That's where a lot of those metrics want to come into play as well. <clears throat> and then these types of products are generally not difficult to use and can be learned intuitively without like onboarding. Maybe for you, some of them are, but uh, overall, the goal is, of course, not to be super difficult. And then like a normal day-to-day -day prospect is going to pay for these out of pocket. You know, sometimes the user will pay for multiple of the same platform. So like in my case, going back to a music producer example here, you know, I have Spotify, I've got Apple Music, and I've even thought about YouTube Music because like each one brings its own unique value offering to me. So just some examples again, or what I just mentioned, Netflix, MailChimp, Adobe, Canva, all those are self-service. Again, B2C examples, uh, but as we've touched on, these could also be B2B offerings as well if the product is simple enough at the time. Inversely, high touch model, it's kind of just do everything the opposite way of what I just said, right? <laughs> so SaaS companies take a direct sales approach here. So again, often B2B SaaS, dealing with large companies that want to, want to and can pay a lot of money for their services. Um, these SaaS offerings are typically software that can be used to manage you know, entire business operations. There's a level of specificity for each customer and key here in a high touch you know, SaaS model. Uh, resources need to be put towards that relationship and built with the customers. This also means that you need to have dedicated support or customer success teams. And <clears throat> inversely from you know, a customer using multiple of the same types of this, uh, no business usually uses two of the same type of platforms unless they're very large and it's for separate entities uh, within that business. I've seen this happen within Chargeify. I've seen it happen to other CRMs and things like that. Uh, this could also be, there are times where high touch can also be B2C. Uh, I bought an order track the other day. I went through a sales rep. I didn't do it online. So there are times where a little bit more high touch process can be involved. Um, but generally, again, it is more to B2B. Uh, things like Stripe, Atlassian, uh, Chargeify, Salesforce, HubSpot, Braintree, you, know, you name it, things like that. So what does this mean for you as a startup? Which of these routes are best? You know, what does it mean to from today and as you're going into the future? So again, let's take a look back at what I call ancient Chargeify circa 2009, uh, where it all began. So I mentioned early on that Chargeify started as a free beta platform, then quickly developed into a paid platform that changed based on customer charge, based on customer count. So something that no mainstream billing platform really does any longer. So when we first started out, the goal is to get people onto Chargeify and then get them to be evangelists about the product. Why would you want to do that? Because your friend telling you about software is more personal and the direct connection is more powerful than, you know, a marketing message is really ever going to be. So it's good about that personal evangelism. So Chargeify evolved this platform and thus its pricing. And we eventually enabled the sales team years later and brought Chargeify over to this B2B high touch model. So today we work to bring simple solutions to complex billing problems and truly run through sales cycles and onboarding cycles, whereas 10 years ago, 12 years ago, you signed up and off you went, you were good to go. So interestingly as well, again, you know, we started B2B, but as a low touch. So back to the question of what does this mean for your business? It means don't start with more than you can handle. If you want to get out there and start in a self-service model, whether you're B2C or B2B, and if you're B2B, then eventually graduate, if you will, into a full high-touch model or even a combination of high-touch and low-touch. I see this often where businesses still have their B2C, or excuse me, uh, like low-touch model, but it also with the high-touch model. HubSpot's a good example of this where they have, you know, smaller SMB, self-service, but then mid-market and enterprise are very high-touch, of course. So work on your product and marketing, get the software where it needs to be, and then some, and then iterate on the sales process with a high-touch model as you feel more comfortable with where the product is at 
<clears throat> and the current revenue volume is at, right? If you don't have revenue, you don't need to be hiring a sales team yet. Just get the product, get it marketed and get it out there. Then develop that team, then develop more of that high touch if that's the direction you want to go. So next is the value your customers receive. Shocker, we have a slide directly on customers and value. So something I've mentioned a hundred times now is value. Somebody is going to pay for the offering that they receive as true value with, about what they're going to get. Customers pay for that value and customers make those decisions based on their emotions at the time of their buying decision. Buyers are emotional decision makers that want their problem solved. And when it fits that bill, it gives that glorious, again, warm and fuzzies I've alluded to a few times, which means your product has fulfilled the needs of their business or that connection has been established with the consumer, however that is, depending on whether you know it's B2B or B2C again. <clears throat> the basic of economics here, you know, people are willing to pay upon value that they place on a product. So what are your customers willing to pay for your product? Is the value directly linked with the pricing that you're offering? Did you overprice or did you underprice? You know, what is your competition doing? You know, if you charge too high, you're going to, for something that, you know, doesn't need to be priced that high, you'll end up in a hole you're going to have to dig yourself out of. And that's not a fun place that any business wants to be. When customers see the true value when they're comfortable in the closest way possible. Your sales cycle becomes shorter and the connection is made. Again, B2C or B2B. So it's almost impossible to fabricate a number that correctly reflects how your customers feel about your product until you do that research. And again, that's where value-based pricing is key. You know, more so again on the usage base, events base, prepaid, things like that, where you can really, really link that value again with your customer. <clears throat> so continuing on. Total cost. So overall, what goes into my offering and what can I do to, to still keep the lights on, but you know, maintain a great margin and a great value? So what goes into this? We have variable costs like development and product, uh, product marketing, those good things. And then there are the fixed costs where no matter what, there's always going to be something there. So like that hosting platform, so AWS, for example, is always going to be there. And then there's a the profit margin, which of course we all know is great in software, um, but you have to make sure that we don't let the allure of profit margins cause you to outprice yourself and then ultimately price you out of business. So building on all this is more complex models. It takes like crazy data wizards to pull all this research together. But ultimately, when research is conducted and you focus on a market-oriented pricing model, then you can directly link value. How are you doing that? How does that make sense? Because as the market fluctuates, you want to react in a positive way for your consumers or businesses, again, B2B or B2C, and you want to be able to adapt quickly on the fly. So we'll touch on this shortly. It's very important to be able to adapt to changing scenarios. And we all know of 2020, you want those things, those things can change very quickly. So overall cost and value your customers receive and perceive equals that perfect mix. So this kind of ties into optimization which is you know, typically seen in B2B SaaS companies as the many ways a company prices, their lists, their matrices, their tiers, customer-specific agreements, you know, on-the-spot negotiations, price overrides. It's all interconnected and it drives this crazy web of, of complexity into it. So all this gets factored into how the pricing should be modeled and facilitated. You don't want to find yourself in a spot where a negotiation happens and you cannot meet the need because you're afraid to drop the price uh, lower for fear of not being able to keep the lights on, right? Or not being able to pay people. So if you do that, then you aren't optimizing your pricing strategy appropriately and you're starting at your threshold, which is not a good idea. You want an elastic system like Chargeify that can help you ingest pr prices that you need after all those calculations have been done and then model them on the fly so that your customer's needs can be met with ease, right? That's the, that's the goal. So total costs and optimization always go hand in hand every time and extremely paramount here. Lastly, in competitive pricing, this, as I mentioned, favorite space to be in right here, <laughs> because it, to me, it makes the most sense, right? That's the value I get out of it. To me, it makes sense. It's very clear cut. So let's think about a few things when it comes to competitive pricing. Are you equal in value? Are you equal in price? You know, look at those similarities from your competition. Look at your pricing page. Do you have a pricing page or do you have hidden pricing? So think about that. What message then does that send to your customers? Now I can think of here an example of where back in the day when Chargeify decided that it was going to hide its pricing from everybody else. You had to go through the sales process that led to, well, a couple things that we kind of figured out. And one was that it attracted larger businesses not having a pricing page. Um, 
but then it also attracted smaller businesses who were just curious about pricing. But two, which I think is the important thing, it told us that we needed to have pricing visible at the time because we weren't quite ready back then for overly large and complex billing needs like we are suited for today. So that hidden pricing kind of says, hey, you're going to be more enterprise, whereas visible might be more mid-market or SMB. So to reflect on that for everyone here, your pricing page or lack thereof tells a lot about your, your target market, SMB, mid-market, enterprise. But it also tells you who your competition is. So like for us, it was kind of a mix. Some of our competitors had pricing visible, some of them didn't. But again, the point of this is knowing where they are and knowing what they're doing as well. So again, additionally as well, I think this is important to know, being cheaper does not always win the deal. So knowing your customers and knowing where you're at, just because you come in at $29 and they're $49 or, or whatever the case is, doesn't mean you're going to win. So just because your competition may raise to the bottom does not mean you need to as well. Additionally, it doesn't mean that you need to start way below your competition either. So keeping focused and in line with who you want to compete with and yes, there's always competition unless you just invented something yesterday, then you'll end up having competition. Um, it's always going to be the case. And so knowing what to link that value, customers are okay with paying a higher price if the value is there, right? So think about the strategy and how you can be a premium offering and continue to move up market if that's what you choose to do. So how can companies use price essentially here as an advantage and stand out in the crowd instead of using it as a blocker? <clears throat> so lastly, with that, building pricing model is, is it's crazy tough, right? SaaS companies do not dedicate the time to study the market, your competitors, customers, perception of value, all that good stuff. 48% of SaaS companies have not done pricing research. That is mind blowing. Don't be a statistic that skips the research. <laughs> be the statistic that goes above and beyond and truly understands pricing so that it can be a competitive advantage. Remember, you never stop building. <clears throat> Even when you think you have the greatest pricing strategy in the world, iterate and continue to expand and adapt based on the needs of your customers. So using the building blocks that we've talked about, everything from you know, what type of SaaS model, the value, understanding what your comp competitors are, the optimizations, these can help you guide your pricing strategy to make you a SaaS winner and not end up in, yes, I practice this, the world's worst joke in SaaS place. <laughs> so making sure everyone is still awake there. So lastly, moving on to the last section here is pricing and billing strategy, and we will wrap up shortly. So pricing and billing. So what is the difference? Well, price is how you appear to the market in your perception of value. It's monetizing your product. It's the worst worth of your SaaS offering. So similar to like a stock price when you buy in at that stock, it's because that's what it's been evaluated at. <clears throat> Had to throw that in there with all the Robinhood stuff going on. Got to have a good stock reference. <laughs> Whereas billing is how you connect that value and pricing with your customer and offering. So that means your method of delivery. It's executing your pricing model to collect the revenue from your customers. It's the usage model. It's the prepaid model. It's those different things that we've talked about. Um, so how do we pull this together? So getting to the final stage of this presentation is executing your pricing strategy through the billing engine. So I'm not going to touch on all these here, but at least lightly, I guess I suppose you could, um, freemium uh, and trial. So that's going to obviously, you know, create those offers, freemium offers to drive up traffic, increase that adoption and boost up sell opportunities. Uh, this is where we could offer free or paid trial products based on duration of days or months, however it is, to get someone introduced in talking about your platform, you know, setup charges, one-time cost, um, how, how easy is it to maintain a system um, that you're going to be utilizing, how easy it is to you know, maintain uh, from a customer standpoint and from a, a a business side, billing frequencies, you know, how often are you going to pull this together? How often are you going to bill? Is it every 72 days? Is it every day? Is it week, month, year? What is that? Use targeted promotions to target, you know, to drive up new acquisitions and retain existing customers. Use efficient invoicing to make sure that you're billing unerringly. So no one likes a wrong bill. <laughs> like think about that. Like a wrong bill is a, is a very, uh, very mad customer, if you will. And then lastly, uh, specific, this is more specific to looking at a billing engine, is making sure that they can be connected in the appropriate integrations. A billing engine or billing tool is always an ecosystem application. It sits in the middle of your SaaS application stack. So making sure your billing system can connect with, with what you're you know, readily using uh, with open APIs, streaming in data, all those good things. So that way your sales team is in one spot, or if you're just in a B2C model, that it connects to your um, customer, your success, excuse me, yeah, CS uh, software and things of that nature. So can your billing ecosystem accommodate your wildest and most profitable pricing model, the, the, the pricing model of your dreams, if you will? 
So overall, your billing system should act as the RevOps generator, not the blocker. On sign up, what's the process? Do we go from a high touch CRM uh, driven, rep driven type of a model and pass that to a closed one deal as a subscription uh, or contract into the billing system? Or are we doing website self signups where someone comes right in, selects a planner offer and then manages everything from that point forward? And then what happens upon successful subscription creation? Are we taking the products from the billing engine properly, thus generating the appropriate billing dates and the appropriate line items on an invoice that will then be automatically generated and likely sent to the customer? Sometimes people or merchants you know, choose not to send it to a customer. Uh, will it be sent out automatically? Is it paid automatically or is it paid in a remittance fashion? Is it a prepaid invoice? Uh, is it paid by a credit card, ACH, direct debit? Is it a wire transfer check? You know, make sure that the system can maintain all of these different portions of how you expect to take payments. Obviously, this also determines, you know, B2C is probably going to be more automatic in payments, whereas uh, B2B is often more you know, wire transfers, less of a credit card, more ACH uh, and things because of the higher ACV of everything. <clears throat> and then overall, you don't want to miss, uh, you know, past due payments. So what's going to happen if a credit card is expired, it's not updated, it's missed there. Um, and what happens if an invoice is missed, you know, making sure that the system can effectively uh, communicate a dunning strategy to keep that revenue and keep it in line. So overall, you want this to be as streamlined as possible. So that's one less person having to self-manage, or excuse me, to manage all of these relationships and let the system do it itself. So that way it is efficient and it's scalable in this process as well. So in summary, hopefully everyone's still awake and I'm not boring people to sleep this morning, uh, or I guess this afternoon, if you're on the Atlantic Canada side. So to sum it all up, making your pricing and billing customer centric is quintessential, is the quintessential most important thing in being successful in the market and having that true competitive edge. So customer centric pricing is so divinely, yes, divinely important when you're in a world with so many other SaaS companies out there and it's hard to find your niche in the market. Additionally, looking for a billing solution that allows you to fine tune your pricing into your SaaS application stack, if you will, is the key to growing your business and again, scaling, right? That's what we're all about, especially if you're starting out, you really wanna be able to scale. And lastly, take that value-based approach. I've said it a hundred times before and I'll say it again and again and again, value-based pricing is what it means the most in a SaaS market. We're not selling iPhones for $1,200 a pop that go up because of COVID hardware costs and scares and things like that. We're selling software as a service. That's all about the value and solving for someone's needs and the perception of that value, whether it's B2C or B2B. So kind of in total here, just one last quick thing here about Chargeify and understanding where we are in the market. <clears throat> so just to wrap this up before some questions. So Chargeify starts on this wheel. We'll go through this uh, kind of all around here. So we start with Chargeify BI which allows you to have data points of any analytics you want and then build that amount for fine-grained reporting. Chargeify's catalog configurator allows you to bill and price however you want, when you want. So the flexibility of that catalog keeps you up to speed uh, with the market and becomes, again, an advantage instead of a disadvantage when pricing changes occur or negotiation happens or anything like that. Chargeify Stream allows you to do all of that usage event space that we we're talking about. So you're no longer having to just batch it, but you can stream it in real time uh, and not cause that catalog bloat on different line items of usage. The billing engine itself, of course, allows you to invoice unerringly, keeping up with the billing down to the minute and complex catalog structures with various billing intervals. Some people have some crazy customer structures. <laughs> and Chargeify Payments brings the rev ops of your business to life and automates that payment flow. So whether prepaid, automatic, through gateway, remitted, however that is going to be, fits nicely in that ecosystem. Subscription management, or excuse me, subscription manager gives you a central source of truth on all data related to subscri specific subscription. I'm telling you subscription is a hard word to say. Um, so CS and support can directly manage from a Chargeify UI or things like Happy Fox, Zendesk, Salesforce, HubSpot, et cetera. And then lastly, Chargeify's finance accounting tools where those, those of the finance persona can really accurately close the books with relative ease and speed and have a central source of truth for all accounting related measures. So I believe the famous quote here at the bottom will kind of really sum this up. It's from our VP of product, Barrow Hamilton. B2B SaaS companies not on Chargeify are at a competitive disadvantage. And this is how important a billing system is in today's economy. The market changes too rapidly, as we all know, to keep up with things on a manual basis. So with that, I do really hope that you all enjoyed this presentation and that everyone, of course, is still awake. Thank you everyone for letting me speak with you all today. It's truly been a pleasure and I really do hope that this was helpful and that this is impactful on your growth as a business in a positive way. 
Now we'll go ahead and pass this along to Jen Mendez for any questions that you might have or that might have come up during this discussion. Jen, on to you and thank you everyone uh, for joining in today. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Jared. We actually have several questions. So thank you uh, for everyone attending and putting some stuff in the Q&A box. So the first one, Jared, you have is um, related to the optimization of pricing. They're asking, what should one expect for existing clients' reactions when you do change your price? And how would you approach this with, with your existing client base while also considering the value? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, so Chargeify actually had to deal with this at one point in time where we did uh, increase the price of our product. And so the way we approached it is we did it over an iterative process. Uh, I think it actually took many, many months, almost a year to evaluate that. So for new customers and new signups, we, we had it at a specific price. But for those in our install base, we said, hey, we're going to give you all a discount to bring up into this new plan and give you the new offerings. And so it kind of was a handshake, if you will, to help lift that up. Uh, it is a very hard conversation to have with people, um, but it is something that's necessary as you start growing and scaling your product. You know, you don't want to be paying this small amount for what it was 15 years ago versus, you know, what it is today. And so making sure you can keep up with that and linking again, the product new offering with the value that the customer is now going to receive and what they're going to get versus what, you know, they couldn't get before. That's a good question. Thank you, Jared. Another question we have is, what is your recommendation on a pricing model for a startup having services catering both to B2B and individual? There is the dilemma of keeping the price low for end users, whereas for B2B, it would be tricky to, to like leave money on the table. Hmm. Yeah, so I think in that sense where you could have more, what I see commonly when businesses are doing both is have some plans displayed on the website, maybe two plans, for example, and then a third one that's specifically for a B2B offering. So on the B2C side, you could keep it lower, uh, maybe a fixed rate with additional, you know, a couple of different line items or different add-ons. And then the B2B side, you don't have to show the price on that. You could keep it to where it's more specific, sales rep driven, negotiated, making sure that, you know, somebody's actually going through a process and then they'll understand the value and keep the price points higher for that B2B side, because again, they're getting more from it. Uh, whereas the B2C side could have more of like a self sign up uh, and then jump right into it. All right. The next question we have is what data points should we be gathering as an organization to continually optimize our pricing strategy? Yeah, that's good. So I think a couple other things are looking at like the customer and market research, again, looking at the uh, competition, who's out there, uh, taking a communication plan with those inside, uh, impact analysis is another good thing. So that kind of goes back to you know, the IB versus where we're at, uh, that question that was just asked. And then overall, like making a, a customer advisory panel or like that subgroup to pull together internally to say, hey, this is the research we've done. And then these are the different departments that say, hey, this is where we need to be pricing to make Make our iterative changes again not massive changes on our pricing okay the next question we have is related to chargeify they're asking how does chargeify map value of their analytics product to a cost Ooh, that's a good one. So for us, uh, our analytics are actually bundled in with our product itself. And so when merchants are coming to Chargeify, one of the things that they need is, yes, they need billing, but they need the analytics together. And so we've really kind of kept that within our plans, actually. Um, the one thing we do do is what's coming out you know, soon is going to be the Chargeify BI, where we've upgraded our analytics. And so for us, it's, well, you're getting more essentially you're just getting more of a feature, right? You're getting more granular into what you're doing and more into your business, more different data points. And so with that, you know, comes a higher cost. There's there's costs on our side that we have to look at. There's costs that, you know, consumers using this or businesses using this rather. And so for analytics, that's, that's a good one because we're not specifically an analytics platform, but it comes with it. It's something that someone expects uh, when they're looking at a billing platform. So hopefully that addresses that question. Yeah. Um, the next question we have is, would feature-based pricing be comparable to events-based? Um, hmm. Not necessarily. So if you break it down in the sense that a feature is going to say, you know, I think of... Uh, that's, that's a hard, like, it depends on how you're going to use the features. If the features are underneath the same plan, uh, or excuse me, the same item type, um, then in that case, yes. But if they're just additional features to a plan, so like you get, um, you get everything in the product, then let's, let's pretend Chargeify had analytics separately, then you get analytics, then you get a subscription management, then you get something else. If we broke it down like that, that wouldn't be events-based billing. But if you charged on one line item of usage, so like I had on the SMS example, and then you break that down into character counts in that SMS, time it was sent, languages, that's more of like an events-based model. 
Okay, another question we have is uh, also on Chargeify. This one is with privacy rules changing across the globe, what is Chargeify's strategy for privacy and regional data storage? Ooh, that's a good one. So yeah, so obviously maintaining with, uh, you know, security compliance is great for any company. Make sure that, you know, especially in our industry, PCI uh, is the, is the I guess, gold standard, if you will, for data compliance uh, in terms of <clears throat> specific credit card related data. And then GDPR is the highest compliance in terms of, you know, overall, I think even those in APAC uh, will utilize GDPR as the specific uh, data stringency standards. And so maintaining with those and then our, our data centers uh, as well is very important to make sure, make sure that customers are comfortable, um, first of all, and then that we're maintaining the regulations that governing bodies around the world uh, are accepted in terms of the security standards. All right, we have another question that came in. Um, I currently price on usage. When do you think I should adapt to events-based billing? Ooh, so if you're doing usage and you're batching this today, then if you want to start getting more granular in what you're going to do, again, we're going back to the thing I've said a million times on this is that value. Um, if you want to stop just sending over the batch and start doing it in real time, then is that's when you want to start getting into the more events-based model. So you're starting to say, I want to break down my pricing to give customers more value versus just passing over a traditional batch usage. And we start seeing this with companies who have very complex offerings. Um, start breaking it down. I see it a lot in the cloud hosting and in spaces like that where a company will say, hey, instead of just charging for server size, now I'm charging for hours, data, storage, time, all these different things. So it includes to increase your value as a business and then increase the value the customer's getting as well. Awesome. I think it looks like we have uh, two more questions here. So one is, uh, when should you start evaluating a billing solution? What is that changeover factor where SaaS businesses realize they need to switch from homegrown to an actual billing platform. Yeah, so that's probably the most common thing I think that any billing system sees is someone who's doing things on a spreadsheet or hacked through a gateway, if you will. Uh, it doesn't matter the size of a business. We see it all across, but you want to catch it before it becomes too much of a problem. So when you start recognizing that, hey, we're starting to take up market or not necessarily maybe up market, but more subscriptions and more contracts, and we need to get an automated fashion before this comes becomes a problem, that's when you want to start moving from a spreadsheet or a homegrown system into a billing solution. That way you're not having to do what so many businesses do today, which is, hey, we have went through all this. We've got tons of revenue now. We've got tons of processes and people in place. And now we've got to rip it all apart and kind of rebuild it into a billing system uh, and integrate that all together. And these, there's just so much more involved with that. So if you can catch it when you recognize that you're going to be you know, going up and getting, getting more and growing, growing and scaling, that's when you want to start making that change. So essentially as quickly as you can as a business. Uh, so that way, essentially, I guess you're safer, if you will. We have a couple more questions. One is asking, in theory, for value-based pricing to work, the value to the client needs to be accessed, uh, assessed accurately first. Um, now clients cannot be expected to provide that information. So in absence of accurate inputs, how does Chargeify help their clients to determine pricing? Hmm, that's good. So again, I think that goes back to what is the overall market uh, going to be, right? So it's not necessarily like you're looking at an NPS thing and a satisfaction or saying like, hey, I'm happy paying this for a price. Like, of course, if you tell a customer like, hey, I'm going to charge you $1,000 and they're like, well, I, but I want to do it for 500, like they're always going to want to change that, right? Um, but with what they're getting in the process, look at what the market's doing and then look at the trends of where your software is pull that into it, use that as the value and say, well, yes, we're here, but this is where others are. This is where we're in the space. This is what this means to you. This is what our product offering is. You know, it's trying to speak very generally here. So I'm not talking about just, just Chargeify. Um, but when we're looking at this, you know, we're, we're taking market segments, we're doing weeks and weeks of research into what our, our essentially, yeah, our, our segment and our space is really going to do and then say, well, we're going to break this down and then we're going to charge you based on this rate because this is essentially like the market and where it's at. Um, so to me, that's, that's more of the question. That's how we break it down. Um, I don't know if that really answers it, but hopefully it helps uh, in that, in that direction. You guys are good. I'm trying to think on the fly here. <laughs> yeah, and it looks like we have uh, just one last question. Uh, Someone asked, I planned on hacking through a gateway pre-revenue. Um, does that mean I can't afford Chargeify? 
<laughs> no, that doesn't mean you can't afford Chargeify. There's so many businesses that come to us um, still today who are pre-rev. Um, there is a plan that we still have back in the day, or excuse me, back in the back, uh, specifically for businesses that are uh, you know pre-revenue and they're just looking to get going. And that way they can start recognizing again, you know, hey, well, we're going to be going, we're going to be scaling, and we need a solution to get into this and at least get started with it. Um, so no, that doesn't mean uh, you're too small for Chargeify or it's too early for something like a billing system. Perfect. Well, those are all of the questions we have. Awesome. These are great. Really appreciate that, everyone. Love the love the questions. And effectively, I take that as feedback. So that's good. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. Cool. All right. Perfect. Uh, that was a great, uh, great presentation. Um, some of the stats were kind of mind blowing because every, every time I've ever seen companies change their SaaS pricing, I've seen some positive outputs from that. And, and in your data, 98% saw improvements after changing their pricing. Yet on the other spectrum, only 48% have even put the effort into the pricing research. So um, I guess the key takeaway for, for everyone here is to, uh, to go out and, and research and experiment and and uh, play around with the pricing. And, and you had some great examples and models there for, for everyone to, to look at. So uh, yeah, really appreciate, uh, really appreciate uh, you and your team putting in uh, the time for this webinar. And I think everyone uh, got great value out of it based off the questions that we saw. Yeah, appreciate that. Cool. Perfect. So I think that uh, concludes it. So uh, thanks again, everyone. And uh, we'll make a recording of this available um, uh, after this is all uh, uploaded. Perfect. Patrick, Concrete Ventures team, thank you all so very much. Corey, thank you very much. Everyone who's attending, really appreciate it again. Hope you all got something out of this. Hopefully it was beneficial. Happy to talk with any of you all if you all want. Um, but overall, again, hopefully this was helpful in, in really starting to scale your businesses and, and grow up in the SaaS world. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. Thanks, everyone.